I got check marks. It's showtime. Uh, hey, Lisa, how you doing? I'm doing well, David. How about you today? I'm great. Yep. Everyone tuning in, it's it's great to see you. I'm joined here live today by Lisa Forrest from Live Oak Bank. And we're going to be talking about SBA loans, and we're going to be answering questions that people have submitted through the community page. And I've heard from people. Uh, oh, look at that. See, I made I made an amateur mistake right there. Um, we're going to be, I bet I fixed it. We're, we're going to be talking about SBA loans. We're going to be answering questions live. People are filing in right now. Don't forget to hit like, and I'm going to start the show. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog, where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Awesome. Now, Lisa, I know that you have quite a following, you know, on social media, on Twitter and everything, but for people who don't know you, let's learn a little bit about you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your position and uh, the career that you've had because you've been dealing with SBA loans for a very long time. Yeah, very long time. Happy to do that. And I'm all pumped. You have a great intro there, David. So I'm like Thanks. all jazzed up. So my name is Lisa Forrest and I'm co-director uh, along with my partner, Heather Anderson. We are co-directors of Live Oak Bank's sponsor finance search fund lending division of Live Oak Bank. And for those of you who, who may not know who Live Oak Bank is, we are really, really well known as being the nation's number one SBA lender, small business administration lending. My career has been uh, 35 years in SBA lending. I do other things and, uh, you know, I've had a varied career within my, my banking journey over the last 35 years, but I've done a significant amount of SBA lending. Right now with sponsor finance and search fund lending at Live Oak, we um, are providing a lot of help and resources around business owners uh, acquiring, strategically acquiring, as, as you mentioned, David, uh, there's a lot of business owners that, that are looking to maybe strategically acquire growth by acquisition. But we're also helping um, a lot of first time new buyers coming into the acquisition kind of lexicon. And we, we hopefully are providing a lot of resources to, to train and educate and mentor our next generation of entrepreneurs. We have the silver tsunami of sellers that are in their 60s, 70s, maybe even 80s, and they need to exit to access their retirement, which is tied up in their small business. And that's what my partner Heather and I do, try to help the next generation of entrepreneur with uh, business acquisition financing. And we, we do a lot of that through SBA. Awesome. And so, you know, how many loans are, did you approve like last week kind of thing? Like how, how busy is this for you? Yeah. Well, on Friday, I got two commitment letters out if that's, that's telling you anything, but um, my, my partner, Heather and I, as a team, um, we'll do last year, we uh, loan amount wise, we funded north of $200 million worth of loans for our business entrepreneurs uh, acquiring companies. And there's a smattering of sort of strategic acquisitions in there. And some of that was also conventional financing. But I would say that we are really active. I mean, that's a that's a really good clip of, of lending for our business entrepreneurs. Awesome. So you just mentioned conventional financing. So let's make sure everyone's on the same page. And can you tell us the difference between an SBA loan, what most people would term an SBA loan, uh, and a conventional financing? Sure. So let's start with SBA and then I'll kind of compare and contrast. So with SBA, the U.S. Small Business Administration, they guarantee part of a bank's loan that's being you know, facilitated under the SBA loan program. So what that does is that compels me as a lender to maybe do a little bit more cash flow lending, a little less collateral driven, where the SBA on, on there's lots of different programs, but for the 7A program, the SBA guarantees 75% of my loan amount. It's, it's our money. It's the bank's money. You are borrowing directly from the lender, but the SBA guarantees a part of that loan. So it compels me to really delve into the cash flow. And, and hopefully, if we're doing a business acquisition loan, 
hopefully for the, the, the business acquirer, I'm looking at the cash flow versus the collateral. But there's right. lots of other SBA type stuff loans. You can get startups, you can finance real estate, machinery and equipment, working capital. So there's lots of different uses of proceeds for, for SBA. What I specialize in and what I think largely we'll be talking about today is business acquisition. So helping you buy an existing cash flow, if you will. So kind of comparing and contrasting that to conventional. So, so the yeah. SBA basically is a guarantee program that helps take some of the risk off the bank. Absolutely. Okay. That's the idea. And it compels me to give you a longer term, maybe require less down payment. Uh, the, the SBA is going to mitigate and mitigate the collateral gap. Because there's sort of a backfall backstop with the U.S. Small Business Administration. Not that we're still not not that we're uh, you know analyzing a deal and really relying on our analysis. Because the last thing we want to do is put someone in a position where the SBA has to come in and and guarantee the transaction. We're not we're not approaching it from that standpoint at all. But it just um, like I use the word compel. It compels a bank to put a loan program together that is le less collateral driven. And I'll just segue right into that. That's generally what a conventional loan or a non-SBA loan through sort of your just normal, uh, usual bank where they're doing a non-SBA loan. Uh, they're they're going to be a little bit more concerned about collateral. Yeah. They're probably going to want more uh, down payment. So they'll providing be providing less uh, senior debt. It'll be a shorter term because there isn't a backstop other than the sort of primary and secondary and maybe tertiary forms of repayment, which aren't, you know, the U.S. Small Business Administration coming in to be one of those kind of forms of backstop where it's just all that small business, uh, small business owner driven. Okay. And and the SBA is kind of an insurance uh, scheme at the same time too, right? Because people pay an insurance premium when they get these loans and that is pooled together to help cover off uh, losses that might be, um, felt if if someone goes bad in their loan correct yeah and that's a great way to put it and that's how i also have described it over over the years that uh, uh, on an sba loan there is an sba guarantee fee that is charged on every transaction and that that loan fee goes to the US, u.s small business administration and that's how i describe it too it's like an insurance pool uh, anyone who's getting an sba loan pays into this pool such that if there's a situation where you've got um you know, a fellow business owner, fellow business borrower, where their transaction maybe doesn't go as as well or as, as planned, then this is a fully self-funded program where the guarantees that are um, honored, where, where banks are asking for their guarantees to be honored, those those get paid out of this insurance pool that all the the users of the program pay in. And hopefully, you know, it's a it's a pay it forward kind of thing where you're paying it forward and hopefully you don't have to, you know, necessarily uh, have your your fees go or their fees to go to pay for something of, of your transaction that doesn't go well. But there are times where that happens. Now, Lisa, you were the guest speaker for my business buyer adventure group coaching program back in March. And so we had uh, an hour long conversation where it was all driven by questions that came from the members of the group. For today, what I did is I opened it up and I advertised quite a bit that you were coming on the show and I had some people submit some questions and I, th I, I think they're great questions and I, I can see people are already starting to pile in here to the comments. Uh, we've got Kevin in Florida, who's a regular viewer. Good evening, Kevin. How are you today? And International Money Man uh, says he's looking forward to this conversation as well. So uh, And so am I. So let's start off just by... Um, talking about some of these questions. So the very first one is from a YouTube viewer uh, who uh, asks, is it possible to be pre-approved for an SBA loan for a specific amount, like three to 500,000? Rather than doing all of this during due diligence, I wanna be pre-approved for a certain amount of money. And so obviously the idea coming from, say, what someone might do for a mortgage, right? Is that possible with an SBA loan? So there's a little bit of nuance around a commercial or business loan versus sort of a mortgage loan. <clears throat> so for your mortgage loan, getting pre-approved is uh, absolutely the way that that industry works because that approval on your home loan is based on your W-2 income, you know, based on your tax return income for you personally. Uh, it might be business and income also, but it's, it's, it's known, known cash flows off of your personal tax return. 
and being able to pre-approve you for a certain amount, that makes a lot of sense. If you, and let, let's, let's answer, answer the question in the context of a business acquisition loan. So you are looking to buy a company. Maybe you don't have the company identified yet. So I can look at your background. I can look at your resume. I can also look at your personal financial statement to see how much you can sort of afford from the standpoint of how much um, down payment money that you have. But truly pre-approving you uh, before you have a business identified gets a little tricky. Your loan approval, not that's not based on you and your background and your resume and, and all those things I just talked about. It is largely based on the cash flow of the company you want to buy. Yeah. So can we get a comfort with you as the buyer and all the things that you bring to a potential business acquisition? Absolutely. We can pre-qualify you when we actually have, you know, see that, that unique specific business in front of us. And then we can pair up that debt service ability of that company within your background. So pre-qualifying when we actually have the business in front of us, it, it's just a better cadence. What, um, you know, I, I've been asked this question to do before as well. And, and, and I think the easiest way to put it is if you're going to underwrite to figure out how much loan is available, you have to be looking at who's paying the loan. With a mortgage, it's easy. It's the home buyer and you look at what their income is. But when you're talking about a business acquisition, if you don't know who's paying, if you don't know the business, you don't know who's paying the loan, you can't really underwrite it. So uh, I think that's that's great. That's a great answer. I will say, though, that that doesn't mean that you shouldn't get started. Right. Knowing who your potential lenders are, getting getting comfortable with with your lenders, getting a relationship started so that that you you know what your bank requirements are and your banker gets to know you and what your skill set is. So this doesn't preclude you from getting started. And I highly recommend you starting a relationship with a lender or several lenders that um, specialize in business acquisition in that context. Hmm. Great answer. Um, Ranger Joe's Pizza, another, uh, I, I love the handles people give themselves on YouTube, um, ask what kind of loans are available for someone who already has a pizza shop but wants to expand to a second location? And then asks about things like rates and terms, et cetera. And, and I've got another question about that later on. So let's talk about expansion. Great. So growth by acquisition, strategic acquisition, bi existing business owners, buying other companies, um, you know, especially in their own industry, or maybe, you know, segueing out and buying industries that might be complementary, or maybe even kind of um, taken, taken a, a try at a different industry. Now that you've had the operational experience under your belt, all of that um, is really interesting. We have a whole sort of program around strategic acquisition. So let's assume in this case that um, Ranger Joe is buying another pizza shop and there are potentially SBA programs that allow even sort of better terms because you've already got that existing company under your belt. You've already got existing cash flow. You've got already got a good balance sheet already. So um, dare I say you might even be able to get 100 percent financing. So. Yeah. Don't, don't go wild with that statement. Uh, you know, it's going to be a case by case. And I recommend that you talk to your SBA lender to see how they feel about growth by acquisition. You would think that most SBA lenders would think that that is really, really interesting. We do at Live Oak. Um, but just make sure you're talking to your lenders up front. In, in, um, in, in borrowing for a business, one of the key things is the debt to equity ratio, right? How much, how much uh, debt this entity is going to be taking on. And so um, when you expand, if the business that's doing the buying has a strong enough balance sheet and you look at the combined of the both entities together, if there's enough strength in the initial balance sheet, then this is where your comment comes from, where you could possibly have 100 percent financing because sort of the equity is already built into the first business. Right. Uh, equity. Absolutely. Balance sheet strength. 100 uh, percent. Uh, correct. Uh, it's also profit and loss. It's also debt service coverage. How much cash flow do you have to cover the increased debt? Uh, with a growth by acquisition, we're looking at the target company. Can you afford the target company sort of on its own merits? Uh, and then also, how is this company going to dovetail with your existing company? Are there synergies? Um, you know, there's so many nuances to how the, the second company 
uh, can potentially make your existing company stronger and vice versa. So it's a balance sheet plus debt service coverage. So your balance sheet plus your P&L. Uh, in theory, you have uh, strengths from your existing company in both those arenas, uh, making the uh, additional debt that you're bringing or thinking about uh, make it, you know, is even, you know, better strategically uh, placed. Yeah. And if that second company is nice and profitable, then obviously that's going to help with all of those things. Right. Uh, gonna, the next question here is from uh, Rich Scott, who at, um, says personal financial risk and default rates. If you default, what happens? What personal assets are protected versus not protected in the case of a default? So with SBA loans, anyone who owns 20% or more has to personally guarantee. And what comes along with that is potentially a lien on your personal residence, a lien on your secondary real estate, vacation homes, um, second homes. There are some lenders that will also take liens on your stocks and bonds. Uh, not every lender does that. At Live Oak, what we're looking to do is, is it's an unlimited personal guarantee, unlimited, but then it's also, um, also secured by your real estate if you have it. So in theory, if something um, something doesn't go well and you're defaulting on your loan and you sort of file bankruptcy, then in you know in theory your real estate and your uh, unlimited uh, personal assets are are there to cover the loan, uh, and then you know obviously the SBA guarantee there is, is is there to help, but the process is that we. We look to you, your personal assets and your business assets first, before we then go to the SBA and ask that they they come in and, and you know, sort of honor that backstop. Generally, uh, 401ks and IRAs aren't uh, part of that. Uh, th those aren't anything that we can lean, but your real estate for, for Live Oak, we're, we're a lender that would take liens on real estate, but not necessarily stocks and bonds. So you got to really talk to your lenders about that. And I always highly recommend you talk to your attorney about that. Mm. Um, I think the kind of charge off rate with the SBA through 2019, I mean, the SBA doesn't necessarily, they're not really good about keeping all their stats up to date and it's through 2019. So there's a lot of data in 2020 and 2021 that's going to be really important. I think their charge off rate was uh, three and a half percent over the history. So I don't know if you think that seems like a, a high or a low number, but um well, it, you know, it, it's it's interesting because I, I think it really depends on what you consider to be a business failure. Um, I've run into a lot of clients over the, over the course of my career who have a business and it just isn't doing well. It's marginal, right? But they're still able to make the rent payment and their loan payment, and maybe they don't quite bring home very much money for themselves, but they struggle through. And so in my mind, that's not necessarily a successful business, but they didn't go into default, right? right. And so- there's also the case where I'm sure that as a bank, really what you want is just to get the money. And so sometimes people may fail in a business, but their loan payment is one where if they got a job or they started a different business or they made some kind of pivot, they would find some way to be able to service that debt. And as long as they make the payments, you're probably not going to come knocking on their door, correct? Yeah. And with SBA loans, that is exactly the case. If you are paying your lender as agreed, even if it's from savings or to your point, Devin, you might not be making a lot of profit, but if you're paying your lender as agreed on an SBA loan, that they'll let you go. I mean, you, you keep doing that. And to your point, um, you know, owning a business is not easy. It is not easy. And sometimes you have to struggle until you get out, you know, sort of the other end and um, paying as agreed is kind of SBA's bottom line. Yeah. Um Got another another great question here from Michael Daniels, who says uh, it's a it's a long question. I'll summarize. Okay. He, and wife, he and his wife run a business where they have a lot of bills that go out, and it takes them a long time to collect. Sometimes from insurance companies, and sometimes they don't collect, and they have to go after individuals and things. So the question is, if they know that they're owed sixty to eighty thousand at any given point in time, and they'll eventually collect most of that money, how does the SBA look at that? And and when I read the question, I was like, hmm, it, it sounds to me like someone who's used to cash basis accounting, because in an accrual accounting, you would know that you had these receivables and that this is an asset. 
So when we're talking about receivables, we're, we're talking about operating capital, what sort of SBA attitudes or options are there for operating capital needs? Yeah. So to me, it sounds like you've got a business model that has accounts receivable and we're absolutely used to that. And most, most businesses do. So for me, when I'm hearing that question, the first thing that's just coming up for me is line of credit, just getting a revolving line of credit from your bank that, that, that help you with the ebbs and flows of the operating cycle and having accounts receivable where it takes you 60 days. And, and maybe there's even business models where maybe you collect even longer than 60 days, but that's just tried and true. And, and you know that, that your client's going to pay, but maybe they're on a 90 day cycle. Some of your customers are going to, you know, pay within 30 or you, you know, the cadence of your particular company. And that's what a revolving line of credits for, for you to, to bridge the gap of the ebbs and flows of your cash cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, um, you know, receivables are great collateral um, mm -hmm. because what a bank does is they ask you to sign in a, an assignment. And if something should happen, then the bank gets to collect. And everybody, of course, wants to pay the bank. <laughs> Although we don't want your receivables. We really right. don't. You know, we want we want to give you breathing room. We want you to structure your in a business acquisition context. Uh, we want to structure a good loan up front so that you have the right amount of debt, equity, and potentially seller note in a second position so that you're, you're financing your acquisition well. And then always we're going to consider the working capital that your business needs, one, to get you through transition. And then also per the question, giving you a line of credit that matches the, the operating cadence of your cash flow and your liquidity. So having a revolving line of credit and proper amount of working capital is you know, something that your bank should be doing for you. So uh, at Live Oak, do you guys, uh, is there an SBA loan product for the revolving credit or does SBA, do SBA loans just equate to term loans? No, absolutely. Term loans for sure, but uh, term, you know, including term debt for working capital in your loan term, term debt structure, but then also revolving line of credit, like a, uh, an SBA express loan, SBA, SBA express line of credit is generally what we're pairing up with a business acquisition uh, term loan. Because I've, I've, I've actually seen or worked with more people who've had the working capital added to the term loan, which basically gives you the money up front and you end up amortizing that over the life of the loan. So yeah. o over time, you end up in a stronger financial position. I guess it's really depends on what sort of cash flow you're aiming for, right? Yeah. And having working capital in your term loan, there's a place for that. And then also there's a place for having that revolving line of credit as well. And they're facilitating two different things. Generally in our business acquisition, we're generally giving you a little bit of term loan debt for working capital to get you through a, a certain transition because we know you're going to have a certain transition expense and then you can amortize them over a longer period of time. But then also having that revolving line of credit for just that uh, idea of the accounts receivable. But also right now, supply chain issues uh, that are really kind of wreaking havoc on cadence of revenue collection, supply chain just taking so much longer. And then also with all the um, constraints on the labor market, um, taking longer and longer to replace employees, things like that. Lines of credit have come in uh, into play even more so to kind of handle some of those not normal disruptions and hopefully um, temporary disruptions that we're seeing out there. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's great. Uh, thanks for coming on the show today. This, I mean, I know that people are enjoying this. Um, I, I've got a, I feel a like question. I'm getting grilled, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, that's right. I've got a question from Michael, who's uh, in the business buyer venture group, um, who, uh, and you, you had answered a question in the group about earnouts uh, when, when buying a business and wanted some clarification on earnouts and it, is there a way to use an earnout in your deal, um, especially if a business has had declining levels of revenue over the last couple of years? So with SBA, earnouts are not eligible. You cannot have an earnout in your uh, structure where the metric is based on over and above revenue down the road, where if you buy this business and then the say the EBITDA that you bought is at 950 and the earnout is based on when EBITDA climbs to a million one, 
then the seller gets some additional benefit or bonus. SBA doesn't allow that. You, you can't have an upside to the seller. Okay. So you can have, you can tie a clawback though to the seller note. So if you have a seller note in second secondary position to the bank, generally a real uh, usual structure is 10% down, 10% seller note, 10 or 15% seller note. And then we're doing 75 to 80% financing. And again, I'm couching this in a business acquisition context to give mm -hmm. us a little bit of focus. So you can tie a reverse note to this um, metric to the seller note such that if the EBITDA that you acquired is maintained at minimum, that's great. You're paying the seller note. But if the EBITDA that you purchased goes down, you can claw back some of that seller note. But the metric is based on existing EBITDA, not over and above EBITDA. And okay. I will say, not knowing anything about the example that was just discussed, a revenue decline is, you know, that's a red flag for me as a lender, for a business buyer coming in. Um, without a lot more detail, that would be, you know, a red flag that would have to be, um, you know, really discussed and analyzed very, very much up front, where um, an earnout. Generally, we see an earnout because the company's doing better. Hmm. You know, and it's it's on a high growth track, and so and, the seller the says promoting the fact that it's going to do even better down the road. Right, yeah. right. Maybe a new product just came on, and the seller wants to get paid for something, all the work they just did, but that's not going to come to fruition for another year or another six months. That's generally when an earnout is being requested, not when you have declining trends. Okay. Uh, there's a question that I put on the list here, and, and it's, I see some other people have, have um, kind of uh, uh, hinted at this too. Um, given that we're now in a rising interest rate environment, um, what is happening with the rates? And are the terms or options changing because of the increasing rates? Like uh, are the are, uh, fixed versus variable? Like are there any things that are changing because of this? So like I said, I've been doing this for 35 years. So I've seen a cycle or two. And when you are financing cash flow versus collateral, like, like a lender that finances business acquisition, where a cash flow lender and sort of the risk based pricing on that is variable. It is a variable rate transaction. And we um, at Live Oak anyway, um, are really more of a variable rate lender. You should talk with your lender of choice well up front if, if risk if um, interest rate sensitivity is something that is keen for you, you should be talking to lenders right up front about that. Most lenders are variable uh, because of the, you know, we're helping you finance cash flow and business transition versus collateral. The one thing that's really interesting, and I think it would probably surprise most people, is that changes in interest rate don't really change your monthly payment all that much. Not that it's not vitally important for you to understand this and not that it's um, a really um, important topic. The thing that really moves the needle on your monthly payment is term. Hmm. How many months do you have to pay this loan back? And with an SBA 7A loan, you have a 10-year amortization, 10-year term. And that's really what gives you a lot of breathing room to be able to afford a business acquisition. Uh, structuring it, making sure that we're giving you enough working capital lines of credit. The structure is really, really important to the transaction. Not that interest rate isn't, um, but, you know, talk to your lender. Most lenders are variable rate and I don't envision us uh, changing that and going to a fixed rate. Okay. Great answer. Um, I got a question here from someone who's joining us live. Um, can a Canadian buying a U.S. business as an E2 investor qualify for SBA? So, Let's let's take this in half first. Uh, can people who don't live in the U.S. use the SBA to buy a business in the U.S.? So the rule is 51% or more of the entity, of the ownership, has to be U.S. citizen. Okay. So you can partner with a U.S. citizen, someone that, that um, can be allowed to be in the country permanently. So that's either U.S. citizen or a permanent residency green card. Uh, investor visas and E2 visas generally don't work. You have to have your permanent residency uh, okay. in order to be able to qualify. Okay. But you can partner with someone that is in the United States. And then uh, we are financing businesses that are U.S.-based businesses also. Okay. And 
um, I, I actually uh, had a client who worked on a deal to buy a business in another country, but they moved the business to the United States and they were able to do an SBA loan on that one. So yeah, they're, that's going to be a lender for a lender. They're open to this. Right? Yeah, that'll be lender to lender. And especially with e-commerce and uh, all the internet based businesses, we see that a lot where it's, you know, a, a company in the UK or, you know, uh, Mexico or, you know, pick a country. We see a lot of that where, and where do your workers live? And, you know, it could be a UK business, but most of your customers are in the United States. Wow. There's so many different combinations now. And that's going to be a lender to lender as to how comfortable they feel with uh, employees not being US based and or if assets uh, are not domiciled in the US. Um, so anyway, lender by lender on that one. But there are ways to facilitate that. Uh, not having the tax returns in U.S. based tax returns, that can be a little tricky. So maybe a quality of earnings report or some sort of audit might have to be uh, completed in order to test the accuracy of the tax returns in U.S. based dollars, too. OK, OK. Um, I got another question here about having other debts if you're going to qualify for a loan. So um, M. Sway says, I received an EIDL loan of one hundred twenty four thousand in December. I've got a 700 credit score. Do you perceive a possible issue in applying for a business acquisition loan over a million? Well, th this to me gets back to the previous question about being pre-qualified without knowing the entity making the payments. It's hard for you to know this, isn't it? For sure. Uh, so, and it also sounds like it's a strategic acquisition. Obviously, you have a, if you have an idle loan, you you obviously have your own your own company. So, uh, having an idle loan does not preclude you from getting additional SBA dollars. So to answer the question, it doesn't preclude you from doing that. Um, to David's point, uh, whether the loan is bankable or, or you know how, um, how we would structure it, it would be based on you giving us actual details about your existing company and then the company you'd like to buy. But you can have an IDA loan and an SBA loan. Awesome. Um, when it comes down to the individual, I know I've had conversations with bankers before who haven't done loans because of the personal debt situation of the individual who is making the application. Um, how big a, a, a part do personal finances play in this whole equation when someone's applying for a loan? I'm going to go to the business acquisition context again, just to kind of keep focusing And that's on this. what the context so, I'm asking in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. So uh, your personal side makes up a, a lot of it. Uh, um, you know, I can't pre-qualify you until I have the business cash flow in front of me to know if this loan is, you know, affordable. Is it the right structure? If you have bankruptcies, I would highly recommend talking to a lender up front to, 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 to know how that lender is going to work with kind of a bankruptcy, but the, your personal side, your resume, your, your experience, how does that dovetail with this, this particular, your company uh, is vitally important. Uh, you know, how much cash and what does your personal financial statement look like? What have you been able to accomplish uh, in sort of the, the jobs that you've had or, or kind of your journey to date uh, you you know, how you've been able to handle your personal financial statement is directional. So that's also really important, even if you're looking at buying a company in which you have no industry experience. So I don't know if that's 60, 40, 60% 60 the company cash flow and 40% you 70, 30, you know, something like that. I, I've, I've suggested to many people that bankers will look at how you manage your personal money and assume that some of those traits are going to carry on into your business life. Yeah. And and so you want to give the best possible presentation that you can. Yeah, I'd um, say that that's exactly how we're looking at it. It's directional. Uh, Scott wants to know, how much working capital are you willing to fund within an SBA loan? Is there a certain percentage or limits or, or ratio of uh, ter uh, term versus working capital or anything like that? Yeah, Scott, this is... Uh, you know, this is one of the most nuances, nuanced parts to why putting an acquisition deal together is really more art than science. It depends what what business uh, model or industry. Is it manufacturing or is it, you know, just um, consulting? What's your balance sheet need? What's, do you have a work in progress or do you get paid up front? It, so the whole cash cycle, the whole liquidity cycle is going to drive how much working capital is required 
from a, an operational standpoint and just maintaining the, the cash flow cycle like we were talking about earlier. From the standpoint of the business acquisition structure itself, does your LOI or your purchase and sale agreement, is the seller leaving working capital in the business? Or are you going to have to buy it, borrow it from me? Uh, is there a combination of, you know, some amount of working capital the seller's going to leave and you have to buy, you know, more and more of it from me? You know, so many of those nuances come into play. But you definitely have to be working with a lender that is going to consider working capital in your business acquisition transaction. And then it's going to be on a deal by deal basis as to what that sort of right approach is going to be. And it's not perfect. It's not perfect. I, I will tell you that most uh, business acquisition clients, when they move into that CEO seat, one of their first comments is, oh, I, I probably should have taken more working capital. It's just it's it's definitely art. Yeah. Um, earlier this uh, year, I released a new module into my business buyer advantage program about normal uh, net normal position in working capital. And this is a big part of the conversation is how much working capital is basically funded by the ownership of the business. And it has to do with a lot of things like if there's inventory, how fungible is the inventory? Could banks are more willing to finance two by fours than ladies dresses, for example. Right. And and what is the nature of the receivables? How quickly are they collected? And every industry kind of has its own sort of rules of thumbs of what's what's possible. So it's it's. It's a great question, but it, it really comes down to, unfortunately, it depends, doesn't it? Yeah, it was a great question, which you realize I didn't answer. So, <laughs> you know, it's like it's definitely a deal by deal basis and uh, working capital should be discussed on every transaction. Yeah, um, we have another one here. Um, are there any guidelines that determine the cash flow risk when you determine the EBITDA multiples required for debt service? Are there any? So let me sort of get to the question this way. So generally for an SBA loan in lower middle market, it's we, we generally see sort of three to four and a half times multiple in most kind of most deal sizes. Although SBA loans, they're getting larger and larger these days. Um, Live Oak, and there's, there's several lenders out there, but Live Oak also has a Live Oak Junior conventional loan that I can put in second position behind an SBA loan. So we can afford higher and higher multiples because we've got the ability to transcend that $5 million maximum SBA loan. So, you know, I'm not sure I understand the full kind of no, nature of that question there, but I'm not the EBA, I'm not the multiples person. You, you can afford to pay a high multiple if, if you're seeing sort of an investment thesis or something that's really compelling to you of why you might pay more for this company than sort of the average. I'm going to try, attempt to tell you how much you can afford from a debt service coverage perspective. Right. And and so, that's, just the, that's just the point I was going to bring up yeah. is, 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 you know, you can pay whatever you want, but the question is, is there going to be enough cash flow to satisfy the bank? And right. can you service it? And if it means that the only way to pay that higher multiple is by throwing in a ton more equity, more investors money, um, well, then uh, that's up to the person doing the deal of whether they want to do that or not. It's generally going to mean that they're accepting a lower and lower rate of return on their own money. And so, you know, why would someone do that? Well, to your point, maybe there's a, a master plan that leads to somewhere more fruitful down the road. Um, but it's it's really it all comes down to what does a cash flow look like, and one of the big dangers that uh, that I always point out to people is when they look at things like EBITDA, is EBITDA is not true cash flow. Uh, interest, taxes, uh, capital expenditures are real things that cost money, and those things have to be paid for, and that money is not available for debt service. So, in it, in it, we might price businesses on multiples of EBITDA. But by the time you get to the end of your deal, you need to have a cash flow worked out that figures out what money's going where to make sure that it really does work um, to avoid getting into trouble. Yeah, that's all, all very, very good points there. And I would also say when you buy a company, there's a transition period of time. And did you get the business you thought you did? Uh, is the seller as helpful as you thought he was going or he or she was going to be um, a, a situation came up where two employees quit um, for better pay at another company. So there was like a backfill um, 
situation immediately and then the sales cycle because of supply chain. I mean, there's real things that then impact and impact your cash flow timing, also mm -hmm. like that liquidity cycle. So just keep that in mind as well. But again, I'm just here to help weigh in on how much I think the company historically can pay for debt service wise. And then I, I know you've got to grapple with, well, what do I really think the company's worth? Because I'm potentially going to get in and do X, Y, and Z with it later on and do better. I just want to make sure that as is, you can afford to pay your lender back. Um, we have another question here about um, the historical uh, default rate. Um, Julio says, uh, Lisa, thank you. Question about charge off rate of 3.5% for SBA. Can you give us an estimate regarding the failure rate where personal guarantee kicks in before the SBA guarantee? Is there any way to know that? I mean, would that be reported anywhere? I, yeah. The SBA wouldn't know, right, if, if the loan got paid off. Yeah, the statistics from an SBA standpoint are, are really uh, tough to get at. And that 3.5% uh, charge-off rate, that's not broken down between startup versus business acquisition versus real estate versus just you getting an M&E, machinery and equipment loan. So the statistics are not really um, well put together. Um, I would say I would talk with your lender specifically that you're working with to find out kind of what their portfolio um, strength is, um, how they work with their clients post-close, the servicing relationship with your specific lender. I think that's probably what uh, I would spend some time on. Um, and, you know, if you file bankruptcy, it's really hard for us to be working with you. And, and we don't you know, we don't want you to file bankruptcy. We want to try to work with you so that you can move through what you need to move through. But but that's that question you've asked is a very lender specific relationship mm. kind of question. And the statistics from the SBA are not I can't I can't tell you. The, so the you've just said that they don't release a lot of details about the data and break it down into different categories and whatnot. Uh, I'm guessing, though, that they are using that data as part of their own sort of underwriting criteria. Um, so, for example, a, a straight equipment loan would the would the insurance premiums be lower on that than like a seven A cash flow loan, for example? Are you talking to, about the SBA? Yeah, like to reflect no. maybe a difference in the risks. It's, it's all no. the same kind of fee. It's all lumped in together, and they do not keep they do not keep statistics uh, for the use of proceeds. And I wouldn't say that. Well, I'm not going to say what I was just going to say, so I'm going to back up for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, can me, you can call me one on one for what I was about ready to say. Forget it. Just strike that. I, uh, I, I know they certainly so, have opinions about different things because they they do publish a, an approved uh, like franchise list, for example. So that they they obviously have some data that makes them take names off that list over the course of time. Yeah, there are some different. programs, but that's a, a franchise kind of thing. And actually, there's a lot of uh, franchisors on that list that aren't even around anymore. So I don't know how much they clean that up very much. So I will say that. We have some viewers saying thank you for the feedback. Um, another question here from uh, M. Sway. What types of businesses statistically get approved by the SBA if available? So uh, are there certain categories that are just no-goes as far as SBA loans? So, yeah, there are some categories that are not eligible for the SBA. Uh, you, um, it, it has to be a for-profit company. Nonprofits are not eligible. They can't be, um, you know, residential um, investment properties. You, 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 these have to be owner user um, pr um, projects. You, you can't get investor financing. Um, it has to be, can't be sexually purient. So you've got to, you know, you don't want to be financing also anything that discriminates against certain classes. If you get on the SBA webpage, there should be a list that you can find about what kind of industries are getting financed, which might be interesting to you as far as why you asked the question. But um, anything that's for profit. Now, each lender is going to have their various industries that might be more mm. or less interesting. A lot of cyclical industries, you know, might be on sort of a, a lender's no go, but another lender might be just fine with it. So, um, and, and I'm glad on the website. 
I'm glad you brought that up because I've, I've often had people say to me, you know, I've gone to the SBA website and it says this and my lender says something else. Right. And, and so the SBA has a set of rules, but then each lender themselves also has another set of policies that, that are going to lay on top of that. Right. And so this is why there is a difference between one lender to another as if, if you were to go and talk to several of them. Correct. Absolutely. And that's where I recommend where you might not be getting sort of pre-qualified ahead, but you can be having that lender conversation. And then you're going to, you'll get a sense of, oh, if I'm seeing this kind of uh, business acquisition opportunity, I know this lender is going to be a little bit more amenable uh, versus this lender might be a better fit for that. Um, each lender can decide their own risk. It'll be, depend on their portfolio performance, maybe where they're geographically located. How big are they? Um, are they in just certain states or certain cities? Um, you know, things tied to like really highly cyclical industries might not be a good fit for one lender, but another lender really understands that. So lots of nuances. Yeah, I know one of one of my clients um, had been uh, got an approval letter for a loan and then the pandemic hit. So this was back in early 2020. Uh, and then when he tried to to get the file moving again, they came back and they they changed the way they were applying the business experience rules. And so before they thought his experience was applicable, but then afterwards they tightened that up and they said, well, you don't quite have the experience we're looking for. And he ended up having to go and he found another lender that was willing to do the deal. And so I would say, especially if you're going to be going out into a business category that is traditionally seen as being more risky, uh, maybe especially now like a hospitality related business, you know, given the what's happened with the pandemic and everything, it, it may take a while to shop around and find the lender who's willing to look at that category. Right. And each lender isn't a one size fits all. Lenders have different skill sets. So I think it's finding the lender that has that particular skill set that you really are, you know, you really need. Yeah. Awesome. We got lots of people saying thank you, uh, Lisa, for coming out today and, and stuff. We've got um, I, I'm, I'm really happy that everyone turned out to ask you some questions. Great. Me um, too. I, I don't have to uh, I don't have to get into some of these ones that I set aside. Maybe I'll ask one of them. So, so what typically is the debt service uh, coverage ratio that you're looking for when you're looking at these deals? So I'll be really specific for what, what we like to look for, and then I'll compare and contrast other lenders. So for, for Live Oak, we are looking for cash flow to cover total debt at 1.5 times or better. So that's cash flow that we're going to accept, uh, you know, net income plus add backs minus all the things that David mentioned, new buyer salary maintenance capex if there's any replacement salaries that have to be considered so there there are some some uh, further deductions to the cash flow that that may be the sell side and advisors suggesting so cash flow over uh total lender debt uh, lender payments plus the seller note payments we want that to cover at 1.5 times or better but absolutely that is like one of the first questions you're going to ask your lender if you're looking at a you know acquiring businesses uh, you want to make sure you're working with a cash flow lender versus a collateral lender. Not that we're not going to take collateral that you have, but uh, you want to make sure you're working with a lender that isn't going to be looking to add on an outside collateral on top of. There are some lenders that will lend at a 1.1 debt service coverage or a 1.2, maybe a 1.3. It is very specific to that lender and their policy. Um, we, we've come at a 1.5 debt service coverage just to make sure you have enough room to transition the um, you know, going from sort of searcher to CEO, make sure you have enough room to transition and then enough, enough room to grow as well. Uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that the SBA guarantees 75% of the loan uh, for the bank, you know, backstopping that risk. Is, is that a, a fixed number of the original principal or does it shrink over time and it's always 75% of the outstanding balance? Like is, is the bank always on the hook for some Oh yeah. Uh, part of the outstanding balance. Okay. Right. It's 75% of the outstanding balance. So lenders are, you've got to retain that servicing risk for sure. Yeah. So there's, there, there is definitely an interest on the part of the lender to try and make sure that they're not taking on a risky loan. It's not, um, you know, and I, I know during the subprime mortgage crisis, what was happening is people mm -hmm. were making loans, originating loans and selling them off and not really having any of the risk left over and it was kind of feeding that um, 
that that problem of creating uh, you know loans that were maybe a little extra risky. In this case, what you're describing is that it it, it doesn't matter when you make the loan, the bank is still exposed to a certain degree of risk. So you want to make sure you're you're making a, a wise decision for the long haul of this deal. That's how we see it. That's how we see it. I mean, we definitely want to make sure we don't want to put you in a position where we're, we're having to, you know, ask the SBA to honor the guarantee. We, we don't want you to, to ever get in a position where that's the case. And even if, if lenders sell their SBA loans on the secondary market, there are lots of lenders that do do that to, you know, raise their capital so that they can lend more. You always have to retain servicing risk always, even if you sell some of that, that transaction, because you can sell the guaranteed portion, but not the unguaranteed portion. So lenders okay. always have some amount of risk um, on the table and, and hopefully lenders are, and I think for the most part they do, they're taking that really seriously. Great. Uh, we're coming up to the end of our time. Where can people find out more and learn about you, Lisa? Where can they reach out? And, uh, and you have something that you do regularly, uh, a, a different information session too, that people might want to join, don't you? Yeah. So I do weekly office hours with my partner, Heather Anderson, uh, every Wednesday at eight o'clock Pacific standard time, we do everything SBA, SBA 101 and pre LOI. So how do you think about a pre pre LOI process? And this is all in the context of business acquisition. So we do every Wednesday, SBA 101 and pre LOI. And then every Thursday, we actually give you our cash flow model template and we give you an executive summary template so that when you are vetting deals pre LOI, you've got a couple tools to, to help do that. If you email me, can I, am I allowed to plug my email yeah. address? Okay. I'm at lisa.forest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T, at liveoak.bank, lisa.forest at liveoak.bank. If you email me, I can send you links to the office hours. And we have, you know, a 50 plus SBA FAQ. And then we have links to our webpage with a lot of content on um, business acquisition. Well, thank you very much. I know that there's probably some people tuned in here today that are going to want to reach out to you and, and yeah. introduce themselves. And thanks for answering everyone's questions. I know that this is going to be a valuable recording that people are going to be able to take advantage of. And, and please, everyone, if you've enjoyed it and you know other people that are interested in business, please share the link. And don't forget to, to hit the like button, hit the thumbs up. It helps the algorithm and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got some other people here saying thank you. Thank you very much, Tatum. Um, and um, uh, Turkey asked a question about uh, E2 visas. We already answered that earlier in the show. So just uh, just go back earlier in the show and you'll be able to see the answer to that. Um, and, and with that, we're gonna we're gonna wind things up. Okay. Anything else, any final words? Well, I would just say that we are in the process of seeing a lot of business acquisition activity, a lot of pre LOIs and so we're, we're in a really brisk part of the year. All the financials from 2020 are sort of digested and out. And, and if you're getting deals through sell side brokers, it seems like uh, the materials and the Sims are, are out on the marketplace. So it's, uh, it seems to be a busy time right now. So hopefully, um, hopefully that uh, bodes well for everyone on the, the YouTube. Well, and, and, and so I, I think what you meant to say is the 2021 numbers are now out. Yes. Is, is that allowing you to make a decision on whether or not you're going to put any weight on what happened in 22 for some of these businesses, if they can show that they kind of have swung back up? Yeah, Maybe. it's really interesting, this idea of ta COVID tailwinds or COVID headwinds. Hmm. Uh, we're kind of starting to see that the story is now maybe making sense on whether, because there was a lot of uplift in COVID too, not just da not just downdraft. So um, we're hoping that it's going to become a little clearer. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that's the case quite yet, but we're just, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, all of the sellers have gotten their tax returns now yep. through their, their, their CPAs. And now all the activity is really kind of starting to bubble up. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to okay, say see you later. You. And for everyone who joined us live, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'll see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and the online courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out about how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, et cetera. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, 
all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go out to Jeff Alpaw Customs for being my tailor. Men all around the world can look dangerous, just like me, with the help of Jeff Alpaw Customs. JeffAlpaw.com. Use the code DCB10 to save. They handle multiple currencies and ship anywhere you happen to be.